anti-armor concept in the defense is to defeat massed armor or mechanized infantry formations by employing a family of weapons with overlapping ranges. The objective is to destroy many enemy armor vehicles to weaken his leading echelons to such an extent that they will be unable to achieve a major breakthrough. In the delaying phase of battle, the enemy will first be engaged in the covering force area by any available close support aircraft, rocket and tube artillery, and attack helicopters. The covering force would incorporate long-range fire units, principally tanks and heavy armor weapons, to destroy enemy reconnaissance elements, force early deployment, and identify the direction of his main thrust. During the battle for the main defense area, the enemy will be kept under continuous direct fire from a coordinated framework of anti-armor weapons firing from maximum ranges. As the enemy closes up and enters pre-selected killing zones, he will be engaged from the flanks by tanks, heavy anti-armor weapons, and attack helicopters. Tank destroyers and medium-range weapons will join in as the enemy runs up against our main defensive locations. When he is at close range, he will be engaged by every available weapon. Tanks will only be superimposed on the framework of the anti-armor plan, as they will be heavily tasked for counterattack and blocking operations. When undertaking any counter moves, anti-armor weapons aid the maneuver force when employed on flank protection to cover the movement of the maneuver force to support reorganization beyond the objective to provide an anti-armor reserve to assist in securing the line of departure and attack routes and to assist with rear guard protection and in the picketing of enemy positions. Due to the unavailability of tank destroyer film, they will be visually represented by the M109. We are also required to represent the medium anti-armor weapon system with the unarmored and man-pack tow systems. Anti-armor resources available within the division include the Division Anti-Armor Battalion, the Brigade Anti-Armor Squadrons, the Tactical Aviation Wing Attack Squadron, the Tank Regiments, and the Infantry Battalion Anti-Armor Platoon. The latter are dealt with in separate videos, which should be viewed in concert with this production. The Division Anti-Armor Battalion comprises a headquarters with a small signals element, three anti-armor companies, and an administration company. Each anti-armor company has two platoons, with a total of 16 tow under armor weapon systems, and an administrative platoon providing A echelon support for the company's widely dispersed detachments. The division commander will likely allot one company under command of each brigade, and the brigades in turn may place one platoon under command of each mechanized infantry battalion. The battalion commander is normally located at division headquarters, with company commanders at their assigned brigade headquarters. Yes, sir. There, they provide anti-armor advice to their commanders and help coordinate division and brigade anti-armor operations. The anti-armor platoon's eight long-range heavy anti-armor weapons detachments are grouped into sections of two
The platoon commander is responsible for sighting his detachments, for controlling their maneuver, and for coordinating their fire with the infantry battalion medium anti-armor weapons. The platoon carries a reserve of ammunition, fuel, and equipment for checking out the launchers. It would include an attached ambulance to facilitate operations from forward locations. The platoon depends upon its assigned mechanized infantry battalion for the bulk of its combat service support. The anti-armor companies are organized and equipped so that they can be readily detached to the brigades to reinforce the anti-armor framework covering critical enemy approaches through the main defense area. Their weapons would initially be sighted well forward in sniping positions to engage enemy armor at maximum range. As the enemy advances, they would gradually withdraw to defilade positions in the main defense area. The battalion's administrative company is lightly structured in accordance with the detached nature of its subunits. Its A2 echelon concentrates mainly on forward repair, ammunition resupply, and casualty evacuation, while the battalion's B echelon is located in the division administrative area. The brigade anti-armor squadron comprises four tank destroyer troops each with four tank destroyers and a support services troop. Its headquarters would be located well forward with a view of the main killing zone. It includes a tank destroyer and an APC dozer to assist with digging in. A liaison detachment would be located at brigade headquarters. The squadron support services troop includes the vehicles and personnel to provide the dispersed elements in the forward area replenishment, first line maintenance, and casualty evacuation. The squadron's primary tasks involve reinforcement of the anti-armor framework in the main defense area and the covering of gaps between forward formations and battle groups. Three of its troops would likely be under command of battle groups and deployed well forward, providing intimate direct fire support to combat teams and battle groups. The fourth troop would normally be employed as a reserve or on flank protection. Tank destroyers will normally be employed in pairs and co-located with combat team or battalion anti-armor platoon elements, where the use of obstacles, local security, and digging would minimize their vulnerabilities. At any point in the battle, tank destroyers may be repositioned as required to counter a specific enemy threat. The basic weaponry dedicated to anti-armor operations includes main battle tanks, tank destroyers, attack helicopters, heavy, medium, and personal anti-tank weapons, anti-APC cannons, scatterable mines, and obstacle systems. These will all be augmented to a degree by close air support missions, along with gun and missile artillery. The tank is the best assault anti-tank weapon, and usually leads the attacking force. Tanks also supplement other long-range anti-armor weapons in the static direct fire role. The tank gun system with its advanced optics provides a good night capability. The tank's fighting range extends out to 2,000 meters and its ammunition is capable of defeating all known types of enemy armor. Tank destroyers are designed to be employed in a defensive role augmenting anti-armor missile systems and freeing up tanks for employment elsewhere. They are compact, well-armored, and incorporate a simple gun system, which can rapidly engage a succession of targets within a limited arc out to its best fighting range of 2,000 meters. 
Attack helicopters employ a guided missile weapon system. They can effectively engage targets from pre-selected firing positions out to maximum standoff range of approximately 8,000 meters. As a consequence of their inherent limitations of weather, serviceability, and visibility conditions, they are superimposed on rather than embedded in the anti-armor framework of the division. The heavy anti-armor weapon utilizes a tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided, heavy anti-tank missile with a thermal imaging sight. The system is effective against stationary and moving armored targets, and its best fighting ranges are from 500 to just under 4,000 meters. Each detachment includes a separate man-pack anti-armor weapon to compensate for operations in difficult terrain. The main anti-armor weapon is similar to the HAW, but is lighter and easier to move about. It operates with a two-man crew and incorporates a semi-automatic guidance system with an infrared night sight that only requires the operator to keep the crosshairs on the target. Its best fighting ranges are from 500 to 2,000 meters. Short-range self-defense anti-armor weapons are widely distributed to all elements of the division. The heavy weapon has a fighting range out to 600 meters, while the light weapon is best handled out to 100 meters. These can be easily carried in dismounted operations and are most useful with tank hunting teams in built-up areas. The infantry combat vehicle incorporates an anti-armor cannon capable of defeating armored personnel carriers and other lightly armored vehicles. Its best fighting range is up to 3,000 meters. Obstacles such as conventional minefields and anti-tank ditches force the enemy to present an increased number of targets under more favorable engagement conditions to our main anti-armor weapon systems. Scatterable anti-tank and anti-personnel mines can be employed to thicken up existing obstacles and to quickly block an approach, thus slowing down an enemy advance. They may also trap enemy columns and elements, rendering them ineffective. The firepower and mobility of aircraft employed in a close air support role make an immediate and direct contribution to the land battle. Their rockets, bombs, and cannons are effective against all types of armor. Artillery will continue to function in its traditional role of providing indirect fire support and in separating enemy APCs from their tanks. It also forces tanks to button up, making them considerably less effective. In addition, indirect fire can obscure terrain with smoke to confuse the enemy. Degrade the enemy gunner's aiming ability and damage his sighting systems. Destroy tanks and APCs by top attack and guided munitions. And deliver mines to channelize and assist in the destruction of the enemy. The anti-armor aspect of planning is an overriding consideration in the development of the overall division defense plan. Generally, the division commander's concept and plan flows downwards to brigades and to their battle groups. The foundation of the anti-armor plan is built up by the battle groups, with coordination being effected back up through brigades to the division. The brigade commander's anti-armor plan will become the framework of his defense. But due to the complexity of the battlefield, he will have to further delegate and assign anti-armor resources down to the battle groups. Anti-armor plans must be coordinated with other plans, and especially with the fire plan, which must allow for the close protection and redeployment of tank destroyers and heavy anti-armor detachments. The barrier plan, which channels the enemy into killing zones 
which must be covered by anti-armor weapons. The surveillance and target acquisition plan to provide assistance in identification and tracking of targets for the long-range weapons. And the counter-move, counter-attack plan, which will allocate anti-armor resources in support of maneuver forces. The division commander's estimate projects areas where enemy armor could be expected. He allocates his anti-armor resources to meet this threat, mainly based on what enemy strength can be expected on each armored approach. What ground features dominate these approaches? And what weapon systems or grouping should be employed on which ground features to gain the maximum killing effect? To counter the threat, resources which could be made available to a battle group include a platoon from the Division Anti-Armor Battalion and a troop from the Brigade Anti-Armor Squadron. These resources would be deployed in conjunction with detachments from the Battalion Anti-Armor Platoon and the integral capability of the rifle companies. In addition, the battalion may be allocated a squadron from the tank regiment, close air support missions, artillery-launched anti-armor missiles, and scatterable mines. One of the battalion selected killing zones may also be designated to receive attack helicopter support. Within the context of the anti-armor defense, certain fundamentals apply at every organizational level. These involve depth, mutual support, security, concentration, and weapons integration. Enemy frontal and flanking approaches must be covered in depth throughout the defensive sector. This involves main positions to contain concentrated enemy attacks on likely approaches and alternate positions to provide for concentration of additional forces to contain a determined thrust. Anti-armor plans must ensure an attack on any one position can be engaged by one or more adjacent elements. This involves the sighting and dispersion of battle positions, the coordination of interlocking arcs of fire, and the assignment of combat teams to battle positions in response to an enemy thrust. The front, flanks, and rear of a battle position must be covered by unit anti-armor weapons to defeat an attack from any direction. Rear area elements must be prepared to defend their perimeters against enemy armor. At a minimum, sufficient numbers of weapons must be assigned to bring the enemy's thrust to a standstill. This involves the rapid gathering of forces from less threatened areas, concentrating them around the enemy, achieving a mass killing quickly, and then dispersing or moving on to another operation. All weapons capable of destroying armor are integral to the anti-armor defense. Each must be well concealed with clear fields of fire employed at its effective fighting range and not necessarily sighted within assigned combat team battle positions. An elementary problem arises in planning the defense. Which to sight first, the anti-armor weapons or the rifle companies? Anti-armor weapons must be sighted to overlook likely enemy mounted approaches and selected killing zones. Some of the long range weapons will likely be deployed outside the defense perimeter. Rifle companies are located to block enemy dismounted attacks which are attempting to destroy our anti-armor weapons. In addition, Company positions containing anti-armor weapons may be larger than desired to allow maneuver room 
and avoid neutralization of the entire position once anti-armor fire commences. The key is to sight anti-armor weapons to dominate the enemy over his mounted approaches and force him to dismount. The rifle companies are then deployed to defeat the enemy on the dismounted approaches to the position. The brigade commander's estimate has identified the major and secondary enemy mechanized approaches that lead to the brigade vital ground. The battle group commander has estimated he must commence attrition on the major approach in a forward kill zone on the far side of the obstacle. He has further identified two other kill zones within his assigned defense area. He plans to deploy the eight assigned long-range anti-armor weapons in standoff positions to first cover the limits of the forward kill zone and then to cover the close-in kill zones on the home side of the FIBA. He then positions the battalion medium range anti-armor weapons to cover the various kill zones. And the tank destroyers are similarly integrated into the anti-armor framework. The company's medium range anti-armor weapons and the anti-ABC cannons will normally be deployed in the battle positions. The tank squadrons assigned to the battle group are to be initially positioned well forward on sniping tasks and then held back as a reserve for counterattack or blocking actions. They have been superimposed on the overall anti-armor framework so that they can be withdrawn if required elsewhere. The proliferation of anti-armor resources has created command and control problems of considerable complexity. Resources must be correctly sighted, well coordinated, and then employment must be tightly controlled if their combined shock effect is to be fully exploited. The anti-armor battle and the defensive battle are one in the same and must be regarded as such. Anti-armor weapons are a vital part of the flexible defensive framework and must be capable of being repositioned as the battle develops. Success in the anti-armor battle will be based on the skilled handling of the division anti-armor weapon systems and the manipulation of the defensive framework. <laughs>